It is clear from these rarely seen color television pictures that the crew of Apollo 11 high resolution color video camera with them on their mission. Yet the only pictures broadcast live from the moon's surface were these from a low definition black and white camera. In fact, the networks complained because in addition to this, they were forced to shoot the images second generation off of a projection TV of the technology of 30 years ago and were not even allowed to take a direct feed, which further degraded the quality and clarity of the images. Perhaps this was precisely what NASA and the federal government had in mind. After all, it was a first, regardless of where they were. Better to open up their debut mission with fuzzy pictures and numerous blackouts rather than show too much revealing detail of a false scene that was yet unproven. And finally, the element that seals their fate. All the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th, and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity of the actual spacecraft, necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Call Apollo 11. Houston Goldstone says that the TV looks so great. Over. Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Uh, Roger, Neil, we just wanted a narrative such a weekend when we get the playback we can sort of correlate what we're so much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a uh, the, uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. 
What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from any other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth's shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out, or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with a TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls, but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert. Finally, the iris is opened up to see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July, and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July, and then the 20th, and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon. How can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier, and the moon is some three days' journey away? Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon, why would they be faking any part of it? Why this trickery with the window? By faking being halfway to the moon, it becomes apparent that they did so because they could not even go halfway. On the 25th anniversary of the event in 1994, Neil Armstrong made a rare public appearance and held back tears as he spoke these brief cryptic remarks before the next generation of taxpayers. Today we have with us uh a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers.